Hi, Dennis Weiss for Eagle Communications. Welcome to Why Like Ike for the inauguration month. We are going to talk 1956 inauguration. Dwight David Eisenhower, Pam Sanfilippo, Troy Elkins, my experts of the day. How are you guys this fine day? Just great. great. Uh, we're filming this in November. What a beautiful day outside on the campus. There's construction going on. There's improvements yeah. happening outside. And we have a fascinating topic uh, to talk about our favorite president, Dwight David Eisenhower. Okay, Pam, kick us off. Okay, well, the election in November of 1956 uh, pitted Eisenhower against his 52 rival, Adlai Stevenson, and he won by a great margin. We have a map here that shows the Electoral College results. Uh, Eisenhower received 457 of those, Adlai Stevenson 74. So, uh, And uh, as far as the popular vote was concerned, he won uh, with 57% of the majority of the population to 42 mm -hmm. for Stevenson. So. Uh, even better than his 52 campaign. You know, um, uh, as we have the luxury of sitting here and talking about the past and what a great subject matter we always have to, do, to discuss. Part of the value of this, I think, is to remind people a little bit, maybe have a little hope about some things. Uh, Dwight David Eisenhower was a very positive president because he solved problems mm -hmm. and he did it in a way that made more people happy than it made upset. And his electoral results show that pretty clearly mm -hmm. across the country. So we have a great thing to talk about, so. Yes. Yes. And Love the car. <laughs> Not too many open top cars in the inaugural parade these days. No, no, that's a, a model of the parade car that Eisenhower wrote in that we use for some of our programs here. Display and um, so people had been concerned after Ike had had the heart attack in uh, '56 whether he would even run for a second term. Um, of course, he did, and and people were confident that he would uh, do a great job in, in the second uh, term, and uh, kind of kicked it off with uh, when he took the oath. He had the Bible turned to uh, the Bible that his uh, mother had given him when he graduated from okay. West Point. He had it turned to Psalm 33, verse 12, which says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. Mm. So uh, something that meant a lot to him. When we toured the boyhood home earlier uh, this year, um, the family Bible there was an important part of the, the features of that home. And for those who saw the program, they probably remember, but if you haven't been in that home, it, it shrinks when you put three, camera, uh, three people in a camera in there <laughs> considerably. So I suppose when you put a half a dozen kids running around from the neighborhood, it really shrank. Uh, so that Bible having such a prominent place in, in the official room, in the mm -hmm. sitting room, in the room reserved for Mrs. Eisenhower, I thought that was kind of an uh, important feature. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, neither she or her husband were alive to see Dwight take office um, either, either election. Um, and then in his inaugural address, uh, he talked very much about um, the growth of the country, the expansion and everything great, the prosperity that the United States has achieved at, to that point, but he's, he spends most of the inaugural address talking about the role of the United States in the, the nation, in, in the world, mm. and what our uh, obligations are. Uh, yeah, and it was an interesting pivot, isn't it? You know, Eisenhower, one of the slogans that even the, the person who only knows a little about Dwight David Eisenhower's administration, eight years of peace and prosperity, we make that point all the time here, but it was created out of something and it was moving into something else in the world. So I think Mr. Eisenhower always had that forethought hat on 
you know, here's the challenges we face, here's what's in front of us as a nation, as a people, decisions that were to be made, and he spent considerable time in his inaugural address doing that. Right. Oh, well, yeah, some of the uh, stuff we have is actually one of many uh, license or bumper stickers that came out during the campaign, 56 okay. campaign, and it's Instead of the I like Ike, it's the I, I'm for Ike too, for Texas of 56, making it look like a license tag. That seems almost like something you'd see on a teenager's texting device today, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> the shorthand. The Twitter, yeah. the Twitter version. Yeah. The Twitter version, uh, at. It's almost got an ad in there too, you see. Much easier to read, I mean, mm. at least for me. Yeah. So. <laughs> the other is, uh, this is a cartoon that was drawn and it was drawn by a, uh, a Jargis Bergs who is from Latvia and just celebrating the the 52 and 56 election and uh, uh, Eisenhower and Nick Nixon being elected and basically uh, uh, Mr. Bergs has even wrote a little letter on the back and this is from early in 57 and it's just saying that the, today the world stands at the crossroads of the future. The roads are dominated by two leading nations of the world. One of these, the United States, represents the ideal democracy, but the other, the Soviet Union, the merciless despotism. So this was... And the a, author was a Latvian. Latvian. So very Eastern European, the, mm. from people with Eastern European uh, views had held this election of being very important for Eisenhower to continue on. Mm -hmm. the, in the, we're in the middle of the Cold War then. Yes. Um, um, the Cold War that was only that far from being a war war from time to time. And uh, it, I think maybe um, in today's universe of where we all know everything on every device, the fact that this news was still spread mostly manually. Even, this was an example of mass media, this newspaper in front of us. So uh, having somebody from that was a Latvian write a letter to the president, including cartoon, that's a political statement in the method of communication of that time that would equivocate with 100,000 tweets about the subject today. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. it is. And it, the fact that it has survived in this form at the museum as a testament to what was going on at the time points out the unique opportunity that this library and this facility offers to the world. You know, we can look at real history and think, uh, and hopefully, Pam, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and you're right, the, the newspapers of the time um, were all praising Eisenhower, um, and that's probably why the people reelected him. They wanted him to continue the policies that he had started during his first term in order to keep that Cold War mm -hmm. cold and maybe bring mm -hmm. uh, peace throughout the world. Uh, that was certainly his goal and his talk in the, the mission. And uh, there are a couple of points that I have found interesting about the inauguration itself. He did have Marian Anderson sing the national anthem. I didn't know right that. Right before that. We just found that in, in one of the newspapers. Oh, really? And uh, have a picture of that that can be added. And um, it, so that was very, very interesting since later on she would be denied the opportunity to sing on the uh, steps of the um, Lincoln Memorial at the beginning of the Civil War centennial after Eisenhower was out of why office. Why do we know? Why? <laughs> because she was African-American. Why both? I mean, but what was the change? What do we know about that? That's just too well, interesting a subject it, it to not is. ask why. Um, <laughs> I don't know if Eisenhower helped to select, you know, mm -hmm. who was going to be there at his mm -hmm. inauguration. Um, he, he, there was a committee that was formed. I, uh, that talked about the Negro participation in the inaugural committee. Mm -hmm. And there's some very mm -hmm. interesting, this is a report that was prepared in February of 1957 that talks about it. And it says um, 
the inauguration of President Eisenhower and Vice President Nixon in 1957 saw the American Negro cast in an exciting, challenging, and difficult role. Exciting mm. because inaugural visitors would witness, for the first time in the nation's history, white and Negro people eating at the same restaurants, living at the same hotels, attending the same schools, places of amusement and entertainment, challenging because the whole concept of Negro full equality and rights is relatively new. It goes on to talk about that. I think that's the answer so. to the question, then, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, if this is, was, is a policy statement by who exactly. sang the national anthem. Exactly. Uh, it's po uh, Eisenhower crafting policy in front mm -hmm. of people, the public, the citizenry, leading by right. example. And it's no after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, mm -hmm. which desegregates the schools and other institutions. And so this is the first real public uh, example that mm -hmm. Eisenhower is able to demonstrate his support of. So Leaders lead, they stand up, they walk out front, they do something to represent their point of view. And uh, Eisenhower is the best example of that, that we, we need look no further mm -hmm. uh, in the presidential line to find a guy who, who, who made decisions uh, and led by example. Great story, tremendous story. Mm -hmm. and, and the papers are just full of all of these pictorials of Eisenhower's career and uh, the people there, and the excitement. They talk about how it was cloudy that morning and rainy and then the clouds broke through as he was giving mm -hmm. his inaugural address. Uh, certainly gives that, that visual that what is to uh, what it portends for the future of the country. Well, I was born in 1957, so, you know, Eisenhower is my birth president. Uh, I was born in August of that, that 57 year, so uh, that, that's an interesting thing to me, to me, to connect my old life. I feel <laughs> old most days. Um, the length of my life is coterminous with, with Eisenhower's political life. And uh, the influence that he had on our nation as a person, as our leader, has been tremendous. Uh, I think of one of the first two or three times I had Carl Weisenbach on camera and we're talking about it, and he was talking about the researchers who come here. You know, the numbers of people who come here to write books, to study, and, and we, were, we were in his office shooting something in there, and maybe it was before the camera came on, I think it was, and, and uh, Tim Reeves came in. He, uh, I've got to go pull some papers for the administration. And I foolishly said to Carl, what administration? He said, the president's administration. <laughs> so, you know, how relevant uh, Eisenhower still is today. Um, but it's cool that we can have these archives and, and to tell the story. Mm -hmm. Hey, I noticed something on the map. You need to explain sure. to me. Why is there a baby's cradle right in Iowa? That's a fi I know why there's a fishing pole in Colorado, but a baby cradle in, in Iowa, and I, the golf club's there, I understand, but the baby cradle, I don't know. Boone, Iowa, that's where Mrs. Eisenhower, Mamie, was born. Oh, really? Look at that. A real <laughs> expert to answer the question just like that. That's cool. You know, isn't it so interesting? Uh, because this is the presidential library, you get to see things. Now, we get to see them right here in front of us, but you know, these these archive displays that are rotated mm -hmm. all the time are so people can see things and go, I wonder why that is. And, and I suppose if you don't have Pam Sanfilippo, <laughs> you'd have to Google it, but pretty cool answer. Well, and the other interesting thing on this uh, is, I don't know if you want to talk about it, the campaign mm -hmm. actually only ran from August 21st, mm -hmm. which is when the Republican National Committee nominated him for the second term to the election on November 6th. Don't we wish it were that way today? <laughs> yes, we do. And then it, it goes into detail about the number of miles traveled um, by the president and vice president. A whole president. whopping 15,000 by the air. By air, mm -hmm. Mm hmm But a very new form of transportation yeah. Yeah. Uh, at that time. Less, much less on, on rail at that point than the 52 election and then motorcade. So this, this is a tougher question, Pam. So if you don't know this, <laughs> that's okay. But 
What model of airplane do you think they sketched out there? <laughs> that I'll turn over. I, I do believe that's supposed to be a sketch of the Constellation. Yes. Uh, which would have been Another the Columbine correct at this answer point, at this point. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead, I was just uh, going to say, have you heard that the uh, Air Force One, the Constellation, the original, is being refurbished and maybe gets flown back to Kansas one of these days? Read something about that? You probably know more. Read that, and uh, it's one of those ones we really wish we could have it here, but you know we're not quite big enough, and we don't we really can't build a runway to to bring it in. So we're hoping it's someplace close so we can actually get to see it ourselves. Uh, they'll land pretty short, <laughs> <laughs> so you know. I know a guy who knows a guy, you know what I'm saying. So. There's a highway not too far. <laughs> exactly, exactly. A little thing like that wouldn't have stopped Eisenhower during the Ardan Forest. Oh. So. Well, you got plenty of engineers to come yeah. in there and, and set something yeah. like that up. We too, just so. don't tell KDOT we're going to land a constellation <laughs> on Buckeye and go from there. But isn't that cool? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think maybe, you know, some of this stuff, I'm the nerd at the mm -hmm. table, but I saw the the drawing there and I go that's got to be the constellation but mm -hmm. oh that's you're, you're not the only nerd at the I table so you know uh, <laughs> I, I, I kind of want what I found interesting about this this whole map is that the total miles was 16,993 really and wow. and it's what they put listed at the bottom and I'm just just out of curiosity I had to check as of the start of October, both presidential candidates had traveled over 200,000 miles apiece campaigning. I'm sure. Just to show you how, just what the increase in travel has become for presidential campaigns. Yeah, I just looked at the, uh, the arrows all come out of the east, the lines all come out of the east, but oh, there's one, two, three that go to the west coast. There's two that go to Florida. There's some road trips that go up into New Jersey. Connecticut, uh, no, yeah, New York, New Jersey is as far north as anybody went, and over to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Not very, yeah. that's not going very many places, really. No. Peoria, Illinois, Lexington, Kentucky. Yeah, what a change from today. Mm -hmm. And we have all the mass media where you can speak to anybody anywhere simultaneously, so, but, yeah. Well, I would imagine he really didn't have to campaign as much as he did with the first election. Mm -hmm. People knew him. He was busy. He, right before um, the election, of course, he was dealing with all kinds of issues that kind of cut short some of his campaigns as well and sent him back to, to D.C. How many people could you name on the map behind, uh, on the picture behind me, Pam, before we really put you on the spot? That, that I would not. <laughs> we need to do that. I want a program, you out there, I, I want see. a program where we, we take this picture and we <laughs> identify as many people as possible. Put your sophomore class on that project. There you go. It doesn't have to be done right now, but I want to do that, even if it's just a bottom layer, because mm -hmm. there... Eisenhower is surrounded by people's stories, and those mm -hmm. people are up there. And we have a lot of their papers. And I do see Marian Anderson right Looky there. Looky there. See, yeah. you already started on the project. <laughs> I think that would be so fun to get a high school class involved with mm -hmm. because, you know, everybody's interests are different. Kids, uh, Eisenhower, they're bored immediately because they think they know everything about mm -hmm. him, right? But not when you get into the people like, who's that? Who's, and, and why are they significant? Mm -hmm. Somebody will be interested in the answer to that question. Oh, I, I think we should do that. I think that'd be a terrific <laughs> thing to do. So that's your job. Okay. Okay. You can ask for help if you want. I'll, I can recruit you some high schoolers or something. There you go. All right. All right. So we're down to a minute. Uh, what's our final sign off about the inaugural and why is it important and why does it make us why like Ike? You want to start? No, I'll let, you, okay. I'll let you have that one. <laughs> I think it was a, a distinct uh, voice of the people saying, we, we like Ike, we still like Ike for another four years, yeah. and he would go on to leave a, a legacy during those next four years. Uh, 
We, did, we just came through a real tough presidential election season. Uh, if we would have been uh, adults then, I think you could fairly say that this election was a generous outpouring of hope mm -hmm. for America and trust placed in the leader of America. Uh, you know, 457 mm -hmm. electoral vote, but the country trusted Dwight David Eisenhower to lead them in through another four years and one of the more difficult times in history where you mm -hmm. had truly two superpowers pointed right at each other mm -hmm. all the time. Great program, so enjoyed it. Troy, Pam, thank you for escorting me through uh, the 1956 inauguration. Uh, I'm Dennis Weiss, I work for Eagle Communications. These fine folks work right here at the Eisenhower Presidential Library, Museum, and Boyhood Home. We're glad you watched us today. Hope you have a great day.